The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 64, let me thank each and every one of you who had a part in our uh, worship this morning and to our worship committee, Peggy and Sharonda and the rest of you for getting all of this ready for us this morning on this special Sunday when we begin down the road of Advent on the way to the cradle. We'll be listening each Sunday morning from the prophet Isaiah and this morning we hear from the 64th chapter of that book that bears his name. So Isaiah chapter 64 beginning with verse 1 reading through verse 9. Oh that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. And you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, on this first Sunday of Advent, we begin to wait. Help us, O God, to hear your words and not mine. Words that call us into deeper transformation, more into the likeness of our Lord and Savior, whose birth we're on the way to celebrating. Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, about a week ago, I got an email. Some of you may have gotten the same email. It was from Amazon, that giant retailer who's probably going to put everybody but Walmart out of business before it's all done. This email was informing me of some changes that are coming to my Prime membership. Now, you see, I've been an Amazon Prime member as long as there's been Amazon Prime. Uh, If you don't know it, it's a a subscription you have that gives you free two-day shipping and access to some other stuff. I became a Prime member years ago, primarily because I order so much stuff on there, and it'd be nice to get it in two days, you know, instead of three, I guess. (laughs) But you also got access to things like TV shows and movies if you have access to, you know, high-speed Internet that doesn't come through a satellite dish. Well, this email was informing me that I no longer may have to wait that agonizingly long two days to receive my orders anymore. In fact, if I happen to live in one of 5,000 cities or towns, and that's a lot, so I figured the odds are pretty good, I could get free one-day shipping, or in some cases, I could get free same-day shipping. Now imagine that. I could possibly get whatever I found on Amazon the same day I ordered it. I could click on it on my computer and just wait not two days, but maybe a few hours. And there it would be. And I wouldn't have to pay a dime in shipping. Now, as my luck would have it, we don't live in one of those 5,000 cities or towns. So I guess I'll just have to settle be archaic and wait two days to get whatever it is I order on Amazon. But you know, that email caused me to think for a moment, what's happened to our collective sense of patience? Do we really need same-day shipping on most of the stuff we buy online? No. Do we really need drones dropping off our groceries at our front door just because we ordered them an hour or so ago? No. 
Do we need immediate access to television shows and movies without waiting for, you know, the time they come on? That used to be a thing, you know. It used to be 7 o'clock is when it comes on. We've got to get home at 7 o'clock now. No, nah, we can get it online. It used to be you had to wait and go to this thing called Blockbuster. <laughs> and then you'd cross your fingers and hope somebody hadn't taken the tape from behind the other one. Now, nope, nope, find it online. Do we really need immediate access to everything? Here's the harder question. Are we spoiled by the instantaneous nature of the ways in which we consume things these days? Of course we are. But it's hard. It's hard not to be. We live in an instant world, and I'm talking about more than just coffee. We become so accustomed to the nearly instantaneous speed of life that we complain when things even go slightly slower than we're used to. I remember it wasn't even a decade ago, I was standing in the parking lot of the church where I pastored at the time, looking at my Blackberry. You all have Blackberries, yeah? Blackberry is what you used to have if you were a serious smartphone person. And I remember looking and watching at the top of the bar, it said 3G. And I thought, man, we are in the future. There's no going back now. This is as fast. Nothing could be faster than this thing that I hold in my hand. Do you know what happens now when I look at my smartphone and it says 3G? I would tell you after church that I cuss. <laughs> 3G? I don't have time to wait for this. If I have to wait for an email to load on my phone, think about how ridiculous that sentence is. If I have to wait for a letter from someone who they just sent a few minutes ago to load on the device I carry in my pocket, I get frustrated. That's a sentence that doesn't even make sense 20 years ago. But it's true. Of course, along with all this instantaneous satisfaction comes the specificity with which our desires can be met. In other words, what I mean is it's not just how fast we can get something, but how precisely we can have what we want or what we need. In fact, this is so common, we don't even realize it when it's happening. We've just grown so used to it. I'll give you a perfect example. Yesterday, we went to the grocery store. Now, there's nothing odd uh, about a family going to the grocery store on a Saturday in December, except, except that in that grocery store, there were fresh ears of corn. There were fresh tomatoes. There was even a whole box of avocados. They were green, but they were there. There were all other sorts of fresh produce. Why is that odd? We don't even stop to think about it anymore. Do you know what's odd about it? Those things don't grow here this time of year. In fact, a lot of those things don't grow here at all. But there they were, in boxes, in packages, in bags, ready to be bought. The avocados, I think, were like 69 cents. If they had been 75, we may not have bought one. But there they were, at this ridiculously low price. And we acted like nothing was strange, especially the woman who was before us. She bought all of them but four, I think. We act like nothing is odd. We get things when we want them. We get things how we want them. And rarely, if ever, do we stop to think about how semi-miraculous it all is, how much it might actually cost us in reality, or how much it might cost someone else, how it might just be spoiling us. We live in a world where our every want can be met almost instantly, where we can travel to almost anywhere on the globe in less than a day. I thought it took forever to go from Los Angeles to Guangzhou, China, because it took us 14 hours. But Once a man named Jules Verne wrote a book about how crazy it was to think you could go around the world in 80 days. It's crazy. We can communicate with anyone, anywhere, instantly. Not just through email, not just through text, not just through the voice, but we can see their face anywhere in the world with a device we carry in our pocket and some of us, a device we carry on our wrists. We don't have to wait on things to grow in our gardens or on our farms anymore. We can have full-grown chickens in a matter of weeks, tomatoes year-round, and if you want it, you can have guacamole on Christmas morning. 
with all of this speed and efficiency, with all this productive possibility, is it any wonder then that one of the things that frustrates us the most, the very thing that will cause our blood pressure to rise and our tempers to flare, is having to wait? Slow internet connection? Stalled traffic? Waiting too long for dinner at the restaurant? Standing in line behind someone at the grocery store who pulls out of her purse a wad of coupons? <laughs> All those things can unnerve us. All of those things can frustrate us in a world that has trained us in the art of instant gratification. This acclamation to such immediate satisfaction, I believe, has also led us down a path of inevitable frustration, depression, and blame. Because when we can get everything we want almost immediately and almost exactly the way we want it, it can be hard to hear anything else. It can be hard to hear the doctor say, it's going to take six weeks of radiation. It can be hard to hear the doctor say, you're going to have to go through a hundred days of rehabilitation. In a world that offers us immediate delivery on whatever our heart desires, it will throw our entire world into chaos when for a couple of days the phone doesn't ring after the job interview, when the pregnancy we thought would happen now doesn't happen, when a tumor won't go away, when the medicine takes too long to work. When the addiction won't let us go. When pain hangs on longer than we want it to, the immediacy of everything else in this world almost seems to mock us, to only add to the weight of our frustration and pain. After all, when everything else can be delivered in an instant, why not hope? Why not peace immediately? Why not joy right now? Why not love on demand? Why do these things take so much time? Why does God seem to take so much time? I can hear it in the sentiment of the prophet. The people of God, the people of Judah, have been in exile in Babylon for a generation. Persia comes, conquers Babylon, says, you can all go back now. And the folks who were in exile come back home, and there are people who were there, and they say, what are you doing here? We don't want you here. We've moved on without you. The ones who come in say, what are y'all doing here? We endured exile. And over all of that is Persia. Over all of that is the oppression of a foreign power. And in the midst of all of it, the people are asking, God, where are you? You can hear it in the words of the prophet this morning. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Why are you waiting around, God? Tear open the sky and come down. Let the mountains quake at your presence. Make your name known to your adversaries. Let the nations tremble at your presence. Come down, God. Where are you? The people of God have been through the perils of exile. They've returned to their homeland, and they cannot help but wonder, well, here we are, so where is God? They have some immediate Assurance. They want some immediate assurance, some great sign that indeed God has met them there. And the prophets cry out, wishing God would rend the sky apart, shake the mountains, make God's presence known among the people in a real and undeniable way. But when God doesn't show up the way the prophet wants, the way the people want, the prophet turns inward, begins to blame himself and the people for God's apparent absence. And I suppose that's an easy thing to do, right? Because we don't, we don't like the idea that, that maybe God is just calling us to wait. So when God is silent, when God doesn't show God's self to us, it must be our fault, right? It's what the prophet turns to. He says, from ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, but you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself from us, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean. Our righteousness is like filthy cloths. All our, we all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities take us away. 
There's no one who calls on your name, no one who would ta- attempts to take hold of you. You've hidden your face from us and delivered us into the hands of our iniquity. The prophet does what we all do when it seems that God tarries. When it feels as if God is not answering our prayers. When we've been wanting God to split the sky open and come down to make himself known to us. The prophet does what we all do. He blames himself. He looks in the mirror and says, God's not speaking to me, so it must be my fault. I'm just too bad to be loved by God. We're just too sinful to have God among us. God has turned his back on us because we're just so wicked. And I suppose, I suppose that's an easy place to go when we get bad news. An easy place to hide when it seems as if God isn't listening anymore, when things aren't going our way. I suppose it's easier just to give in to superstition rather than faith. To say that God doesn't answer our prayers or join us in our lives until we get all the bad out. Until we get right. That, however, is just another excuse we tell ourselves. Because admitting, I think, that we're sinful, awful, no good people is apparently a whole lot easier than waiting. I think the prophet even comes to understand that truth before the words even leave his mouth. Because right after he says, you've hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of iniquity, he says this, yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider this, he says, we are all your people. It's as if the prophet needs to remind himself and the people of God, as if we need to be reminded that silence from God is not abandonment. For we are now and forever shall be God's people. Clay in the potter's hands. And like a potter working clay on a wheel, it doesn't happen instantly. It takes time. Time for the work to be complete. I think that's why we need Advent. I think that's why we we have to be intentional about Advent and not rushing headlong to Christmas. We need this sort of traditional season of the traditional church that can sometimes be so easily overlooked by newer movements and traditions in the church. You see, there's so much in our culture that feeds our need for immediate satisfaction, and it's that same drive that causes us to start humming Christmas songs the day after Halloween to get the tree out the first week in November, to binge watch our favorite Christmas movies on the Hallmark Channel the week before uh, Thanksgiving. We want Christmas to be right here, right now. But deep down, way down deep, if we're honest with ourselves, we know we have to wait. And I believe it's that waiting that can be holy. That waiting for Christmas, that waiting for the revelation of God, waiting to finally hear the good news, waiting for the appearance of the divine. It's that waiting that can really motivate us to do more in the meantime, to gather more folks together in anticipation, to tell as many as we can about what's coming. It's in that waiting that we can bring a small glimmer of that hope peace, joy, and love that comes on Christmas morning to as many folks as we can for the time that we have to wait. You see, it's while we are waiting for God's arrival, for Jesus' arrival, that we are to be about the work of proclaiming and living into the reality of God's arrival. It's while we wait that the potter shapes and molds the clay It's while we wait that we are being transformed into something wonderful and holy. It's while we wait that we transform the world into something wonderful and holy. It's while we wait that we truly experience the work of God. Though it may not be instant, though it may not be in ways that split the sky open or shake the mountains, 
No, in fact, it might be in the most surprising and otherwise unnoticed ways. Like we saw with Josh, my friend Josh Hearn, and the folks in Danville, Virginia. Whether it's giving a plate of hot food to someone who's hungry. Whether it's taking the time to listen to someone else's pains and someone else's heartaches. It might look like slipping a few dollars in a red kettle. But I am more and more convinced that God moves among us while we wait. And God works in the most surprising and unexpected ways. Why God even works through a scared, young, unwed woman and her betrothed to literally bear the good news to the world while they wait. While we all wait. So how will you? How will you clay in the hands of the potter? How will you be a part of God's works while we wait? While we wait for his advent? While we wait for his arrival, how will you be a part of the work of God while we wait? Let us pray together. Holy God, you are the potter and we are the clay. Lord, give us the strength to be patient. Lord, give us the time. Or to be about your work. Help us, God, in the time that we wait. Or to understand that we are not to just sit idly by. That you call us in the work of reconciliation. In the work of hope. Work of peace. Joy and love. As we now head on into this Advent season. Holy God, speak to us. Show us the works you would have us to do. While we wait. In Christ's name we pray.